Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right. Welcome, everyone. John Corcoran here. I am the host of this show, and I am so privileged because I get to talk to smart and interesting founders and entrepreneurs and executives each week. And it's such a pleasure and such a joy in my life to get to meet interesting people. And my new friend here, Eric Farewell, is one of those. I'm going to introduce him in a second. But first, before we get to that, of course, this episode brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcasts and content marketing you can learn all about what we do at rise25.com. And first, also a shout out to DeMarco Thomas of Metro Max. It's a logistics company. He's another friend who introduced me to today's guests. And Eric Farewell, he's a lifelong entrepreneur, started working around age seven, had his first business around age 13. Get this, selling airplanes on the internet. I know. Uh, back then, a little bit of a crazy idea. So we're going to ask him all about it. Uh, kind of the common thread in his background and history is aviation, travel, adventure, family. And so we're going to talk all about that. In 2011, he actually launched a paramotor business, which is, if you've seen them before, they look like they have a parachute above them. They have a motor on their back. It's absolutely nuts. And he's got an amazing YouTube channel where you can see these beautiful videos. And we're going to talk about how he ended up starting that. He's also acquired the uh, National Stole. It shorts for, stands for Short Takeoff and Landing. It's a really cool adventure sport. Uh, and he's the author of Farewell to Normal. That's his book. And Eric, it's such a pleasure to have you here today. You're involved in so many different things. So there's so many things I want to ask you about. But first, let's start with this business that you started 13 years old. You loved aviation and decided you were going to buy a kit and build an airplane. And then you decided, ah, maybe that's not that such a good idea. So I'm just going to sell it on the internet early, which was this is the early days of the internet. And um, that seems absolutely nuts to me. What 13-year-old decides to do either of those things? So I was born to very entrepreneurial families. First off, thank you for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure to have these great conversations. Uh, but I was born to an entrepreneurial family. My grandparents uh, ran a five-star bed and breakfast here in Central Florida. I started working there when I was seven. It was my job to take the giant coffee urns and pour them in the hot water. Uh, you know, very healthy thing for a seven year old to be doing over his head. And the reason for me going to work was my obsession with flight. I wanted to buy an airplane. My grandfather flew in World War II. My uncle was a captain for United. My mom sold on her 16th birthday. Flying was everything. And when I was seven, I discovered these things called ultralights that you didn't have to wait till you were 16 to fly. And since 16 felt like it was a lifetime away, I went to work for minimum wage. I was the bus boy. I was the bell boy. We had a hotel there as well. So, you know, all of these different tasks that fell to the child labor laws uh, <laughs> were as possible. Enemy. It's Florida, right? Florida doesn't Florida. have those types of rules, no, right? No, we're, we're good. We're good. We're basically, <laughs> you know, Apple building iPhones at this point. But it's uh, I'm a diehard Apple guy, so I, I can say these terrible things. Um, <laughs> that said, I, I, I did finally buy my airplane kit. And it was a mini max. If anyone's Googling, they actually just closed their doors, which I'm sad about. But uh, Wayne mm -hmm. Eisen built these all wood airplanes and he sold kits, single seat, ultralight and non ultralight. And the first step was to put five pieces of wood together, glue them, and then you sand them down to make them smooth. ADHD 13 year old Eric took two and a half weeks to do that, gave up and put it up for sale on this new thing called the Internet in 1999. Did you eBay? How'd you sell it? No, there was a couple. So I built my own website. Uh, Microsoft front page was my friend. Uh, I went mm -hmm. through an HTML checker to see if there were any issues. And there were 580 something issues on a one page website. So, you know, <laughs> high quality website. Uh, but it yeah. was 99. You know, it was turquoise. It, that was the in thing at the time. Um, <laughs> right, lots and, of flash, lots of oh, little blinking buttons. Here endless. And, there, yeah. and you had yeah. to play music that was different on every page, you know. <laughs> you probably had to email to get a picture of the, the kit, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it ended up selling. And 
And then the guy I bought it from was this crusty old guy, Jim McKinney. And Jim said, hey, I've got a hangar full of projects. You want to help me sell them? I'll give you 10%. And I said, make it 20. And he did. Nice, nice. And uh, that was the beginning of a brokerage that was completely illegal. I didn't realize you had to have a license to be an aircraft broker until after I stopped doing it. Um, <laughs> but I, I was selling airplanes for people from all over the country. And, you know, definitely some some wins and losses there. I learned a lot in that process. I hired my first employee when I was 15. I couldn't drive, but I could fly back and forth through the hangar I rented. And, you know, it was a great opportunity to, to kind of learn the ropes of entrepreneurial lifestyle for myself, when did you not, start, not for someone else. So when did you finally start flying these ultralights? Like, not until uh, I was 16, ironically. 16. Oh, really? <laughs> My Good parents man. were not about that life. They were like, you have to wait till you're 16, which I, it's mm -hmm. really ironic given all the other things they let me do. But uh, at 16, I, I was flying my, my pants off. So they probably figured when you were 13, you bought this kit. They're like, let them buy the kit. It's going to take them three years to build the damn thing. Yeah, I, th that's a question I've never had with them. And I probably should, because if you look at the decision making process they made now as a parent myself, you know, at 13, I was taken to an Internet marketing conference with my dad in San Francisco, right by SFO. I uh, met a few guys there that were speakers and I just followed them around like a puppy dog. Basically, hey, can I get you some coffee, Mr. Mendozian? Can I get you some coffee? Like carrying he used their bags to live, for them? He used to live about a mile from me over here. Yeah. Well, Alex, I used to live in his house Mendozian. when I was 16. In Corte Madera? Yeah. I oh, lived in his wow, house smaller, and I lived, smaller. I lived in his garage and I would learn from him and we'd schedule meetings. And he taught me how to write copy. And like, that's, that was, so my parents were fine with a 16 year old flying across the country to do that, but flying to a live airplane. at a guy's garage. That's uh, yes. that seems strange. Yeah. 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 So it was definitely, definitely different uh, experiences, but you know, that the desire to constantly be leveling up, not financially, but experientially has been huge in my life. And mm. I'm deeply passionate about creating that experience in my kids now. And, you know, that first business was just the start of so many more. And I've realized now that they, they say serial entrepreneurials is like a thing to say you are. But the reality is, I, I, I don't think I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm, I'm just obsessed with taking any hobby, any interest, anything that kind of intrigues me, learning everything about it and then turning it into a business because I immediately see a hole where it could be better. Mm, and you end up selling 200 airplanes in a five-year period. So this is your teenage years. You're selling airplanes for other people. And, and then did you lose interest in it? What happened there? So right before my 18th birthday, uh, December 20th, I was born January 7th, I was in an accident. I was hand propping an airplane and it took off with me hanging onto the strut. Uh, what happened was the two carburetors and there's a splitter cable that goes down in the it broke. So one carburetor is at full power. One's just cracked it over idle. So it takes off doing 30, 40 miles an hour with me hanging onto the strut, a 26 inch tire between my legs and the propeller at my feet. Cause the engine was on the back. So you couldn't, knew, couldn't let go. You're, you're yeah, stuck. Okay. If I let go, I'm going in that prop and I'm dead. Right. Mm. So I just held on until I hit a concrete block wall. And <sighs> about 35 minutes later, I woke up airplane still running on top of me. Oh. And I had smashed my head pretty good uh, and had a pretty traumatic uh, back injury. I broke C1, T5, 6, T11, and L5. Mm. And it, I don't know if anyone has ever told you, but that hurts. So mm. my, my my dreams of of flying in the Air Force to go to the Academy and all that were, were put on hold. And I actually quit flying for a few years. It's the first time I'd ever broken a bone. So I decided to do safer things for a few years. Mm. Uh, I got into motorcycle racing. I got into <laughs> surfing. Uh, I proceeded to break, I think it was 31, yeah, 31 more bones, like Baskin Robbins over the next four or five years. And, wow. uh, <laughs> Including your back a second time? That wasn't until about six, seven years later, but that was, uh, again, kind of this test flying uh, lifestyle where I would fly things that other people thought, hey, will that work? And I'd try it and fly it until it didn't. And this one didn't. And I hit the roof of a house. So mm. don't don't learn from me what what to do. They learn what not to do in those situations. Mm. Mm. Jeez, jeez. Um and so uh, I want to take actually a couple of steps backwards, because what was it like for you? I, I remember when we spoke the first time, you said your grandfather bought like all this acreage in central Florida. And then eventually at some point they built a, a runway. So you're around aviation at this young age. What, what was that like growing up, not near a big city and kind of a rural area and you have this runway? I mean, is that what you guys are just doing all the time? Just like, hey, let's go around. Let's go fly the plane. So it's a really it's a really interesting childhood. So not only do we have the runway and the restaurant that I was literally born on that property in my parents' bedroom, right? But in addition to that, my parents had their own business. So when I was three, my dad quit selling cell phones. This is 1989. So you can imagine the size of the cell phones. 
and mm. decided to start selling books with my mom. They'd started homeschooling for religious reasons and they they wanted to, you know, go out and help other people find their way to homeschool. And it sounds great, except the truant officer would show up and they take your butt to school. So it was totally illegal at the time. Mm. Um, and they started off with a tomato box full of books. They stole the tomato box from the restaurant. And over the next few years, it changed into a full-time business with over 20 employees. And our family would travel from book show to book show, homeschool book show to homeschool book show from March until September, October every year. And so we had five kids that started in a trans van, eventually a pace arrow. And finally we got, we actually bought Charlie Daniels band bands, old bus. So like the bus that's on the million mile tour album, that's what I grew up in with four mm. siblings. Mm. <laughs> and so we had that lifestyle on the road and then we come back for the winters and you know, it was endless. We'd, we'd be pulling down the drive in your back and then a, a rotor above your head. And he would be doing barrel rolls. He's actually in the Guinness Book of World Records. being the first guy to do a barrel roll and a loop in a gyrocopter, um, which he thought the ultralights were terrifying and dangerous and he would never fly one. But he crashed that freaking gyrocopter 12 times. You know, <laughs> So definitely a different uh, way of life for sure. Oh man. Okay. That, that's just absolutely nuts. Um, and I come from, my grandfather also was a World War II pilot, flew B-17s in World War II, did 35 missions over Nazi Germany. If you can imagine, not many of those guys came back. And my father, an absolute aviation nut, was in the Air Force, had bad eyes, so never became a pilot himself, but you'd think he was from the way he talks about aviation. Knows, uh, we went to a um, World War II uh, era uh, plane um, museum recently, and it was unbelievable how much he knew about all these different planes. So definitely grew up around a lot of this type of stuff as as well. Now let's jump ahead, flash forward to 2011. You had you'd been a photographer for a bunch of years at that point, um, traveling the world, but you end up deciding discovering paramotoring. So I I probably butchered a description of what that is, but so describe to us what paramotoring is and what you know, how you decided to launch a business around it, training people. You actually, you, you did a pretty good job, um, much better than the average Joe. So good job. Your dad's rubbing off on Wait, you. You said butt fans. That's probably the better way to describe it. <laughs> Calling it a butt fan makes people smile every time. So <laughs> it is a fan in your butt. It's a, it, it's a backpack you wear and it, it supports a harness that once you're in the air, it's like sitting in any comfortable, easy chair. Uh, but it is the only form of flight that you literally run into the sky, just like you do in your dreams. So mm -hmm. you feel like a Superman every time, right? The glider comes up above your head. It takes the weight of the motor off your back. And as you lean back and add power, you're gone. And then you're mm -hmm. flying. And the, the basic numbers everyone wants to know, yes, you can fly it without a license. You can fly it almost anywhere in the US. You just have to know the laws. It takes about two weeks to learn to fly. Costs about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars to get into it, then about eight dollars an hour to operate. The average wing for a beginner flies about twenty-five miles an hour. The more advanced wings fly about fifty-five to fifty-eight miles an hour. They are fully aerobatic if you want them to be, um, which it's super fun. It's like being on a swing set that you can actually go over the top every time. It's super cool. Um, and the, the total time most people will fly generally about an hour to two hours. But the, if, depending on the engine and your weight, there are guys who are flying six, seven, eight, nine hours a day. Wow. So, wow. So yeah. going out for a long periods of time. And what was it like for you? I remember when we spoke last time, you'd been in a tremendous amount of pain from all the different injuries that you'd had, uh, broken bones and whatnot. And um, for you, this was like a literally a weight off your back, right? Yeah, so it was kind of a mix. We we found out we were pregnant with our first. And at the time, I was running a couple of different companies. One was copywriting, one was photography. And I, I found myself hopping in one of my family's airplanes and flying to an airport, land, I'd smoke a cigar, I'd write or I'd edit photos and I'd fly back. And you'd think that an airplane that costs maybe $40, $50 an hour to operate wouldn't be bad. But then you find out that you're pregnant and you're like, oh, crud, we got to, I got to tame this, this spending out of the way because this mm. couple hundred dollars a day is starting to hurt. Mm. And I discovered paramotors. I had started my YouTube channel about six months before I had about 25,000 subscribers. And I reached out to a couple of companies and got a, a paramotor and I got training and I, you know, it was a sponsored pilot to promote it on my YouTube. And it, it honestly, it kicked my butt, man. Um, my childhood sounds pretty fantastic. And like everybody, you know, you can sugarcoat everything, but I had a really traumatic, really challenging childhood with uh, being one of, one of five siblings and traveling as much as we did, we didn't have that sense of home that you would have if you had friends at home. Yeah. Um, I, I had my cousins and they were great, but their friends all bullied the hell out of me because I was this weird homeschool kid. Um, mm. And, you know, that that never feeling quite at home really created a part in me that just felt like I needed something more. 
And if you, thanks to years of therapy now, um, my, my therapist is going through my childhood photos. She goes, man, you only ever really look happy when you're up high on a mountain. Hmm. And I was like, yep. Yeah, mm. when I'm flying, I'm terrified of heights, by the way. But when I'm mm. flying, I I feel alive. And so coming to paramotor, so you're not I afraid thought, of heights when you're in an airplane. Not at all. Not yeah. at all. It's totally different. Mm. Um, and what was really cool is, you know, for, throughout my high school life, I could always get in my airplane and escape all the the BS, escape all the judgment, escape all the the trauma and and all the abuse. But when I was on the ground, I was exposed to it. So when I got into paramotoring and it did the exact opposite, here I am with a broken back, throwing 85 pounds on my back, trying to sprint. I'm asthmatic. I'm like the skinniest <laughs> fat dude, you know, right? A <laughs> fattest skinny dude, you know, <laughs> and it was really hard. It looks easy in the videos, but it's like very physically demanding, very mentally demanding. And I, I'd never been bad at anything in aviation and I was terrible. So I did what I usually do, which our family crest. What, what does terrible worth. mean? Like you have trouble getting off the ground or once you're in the air, you can't stay aloft. What, what is it mean? the getting off the ground? So it, in, okay. in flying, generally landing is the hard part with paramotors It's taking off. Mm. And so, cause you're trying to balance the glider coming up, but if it shifts this way, you have to run underneath it, get with it. The power on your back, but every time you add the power, it wants to tip you forward, which would drive you into the ground, all these different elements. Oof. Right. Yeah. And so I would go out and try to fly and it might be 12 or 15 attempts before I get, before the I get, get off. Mm. Right. Hmm. And so <clears throat> my training experience had been a little lackluster um, and it was in a little broken down hangar with the rain pouring through the roof. And our entire ground school was just basically, you know, two hours of explanation of weather and and airspace and you'll figure it out. And that didn't sit right with me. I, you know, coming from a fixed wing background, I, I was like, you're teaching people how to fly. You got to take this seriously. So in that first year, I flew over 500 hours and got physically fit, got mentally fit, found a way to keep flying really, really cheap. So I could attain that kind of sense of meditative state, which is what flying for me is. Um, and then people started asking me to teach them and I would help them with the ground school and then pass them off to an instructor. And eventually I realized what the instructor was doing was what I had done as a fixed wing instructor in ultralights. So I could do the same thing with them. So we built a, a system, hired some really great people who helped build the system even better. And over the last 11 years, we've kind of become the 800 pound gorilla in, in the industry. Mm. And I love what you've done with the YouTube channel, which is really kind of an extension of the business. And if I don't think I've ever quite seen such a perfect fit between the medium of, of, of YouTube and video and the business of what you do, because it's beautiful. You have these beautiful videos of what it's like to go paramotoring. So talk a little bit about how you've used that and leveraged that as a tool. And I know you've also leveraged other influencers out there who have become advocates for your school. Yeah. So for me, especially in something that's so visually stimulating, like paramotoring, you need to be able to tell the story. People need to be able to see themselves. If you go to our website, aviator PPG or aviatorparameter.com, you'll see a, a pair of feet dancing above the clouds. That's all it is. That's mm. the intro to what we do. Mm. We give you the opportunity to place your feet above the clouds. And so telling stories with video was something I got really passionate about even prior to opening Aviator Paramotor because I'd been a photographer for all these years and I'd loved taking pictures and I got good at it enough to make a decent living. but Video is this whole new marvel. Okay, how do I take what I know in photography? I understand light, I understand shutter speed, I understand aperture. You know, I, I get all of these things, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. But how do I add to that movement and audio and get good at it? And so I took all my photography equipment and everyone else is making these videos that were, you know, that they, they got their phone out and they're taking a video. And I'm, I'm standing here with a $25,000 worth of camera and lenses mounted to a tripod that I hit mount to my hips. And I get my wife to set the focus just right at F 1.2 so that my eyeballs are in. And I have a conversation with a camera moving around with what I didn't realize. I was just building what Hollywood builds as these rigs. Mine just hurt my hips more because I had tripod legs in them. Mm -hmm. right? But it was really fun for me. It was a new challenge. And I think that for, throughout most of my life, I usually have like a, a three year life cycle between interests. And mm. I I've forced myself to harness my attention for 11 in this business, but I've been really blessed over the last several years to have developed even more systems and whatnot. So I have a great team. I'm basically hands off with Aviator. I have this team that manages everything and I might show up to one of our level tens every month or two, but that's about it. And 
Uh, and that's enabled you to dabble in other businesses. And we'll get into um, some of the work you've done with the dads community group of dad entrepreneurs. Um, but also you recently acquired a, a, the um, National Stole I'm sure that's bad business. Yeah, sorry, you cut out a little bit there. But uh, National Stole is National S-T-O-L or short takeoff or landing. And stole airplanes are bush planes. These are planes that have been flying in Alaska to deliver mail, to deliver food for years, for nearly 100 of those years now, right? They were an opportunity for airplanes to get in and out of spaces that they couldn't before. And a few years ago, the founders of this, uh, this company were sitting on a, a sandbar in Texas, and they just landed their airplanes on the sandbar. They're all having a nice time. Like, Man, how do, we, how do we bring this to the world? How do we show normal pilots how they can become better pilots? You know, because practicing stole, you have to be on the line. You can't land long into the water, right? And so National Stole was born from that desire. And thanks to my partner, Tom Flannery, Tom is a whiz kid. He's the kind of guy who can look at a problem and go, hey, you know what would be really cool? What if we live streamed this? What if we took this not to the audience of 1,500 people live or 2,000 or whatever, but let's take it to the world. And so we started creating content around it. I actually came on board as an announcer. I've been in love with air shows since I was a kid and I've been going to air shows a lot. I have my own air show team as well with the paramotors. And we, uh, they asked me to come on and help them announce because I've done out for a bunch of air shows. I was like, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do that whenever I have time. So I would. And then last year I, I got invited to come to an event in Louisiana, which actually we just had again last weekend. And I had the best time and I was so blown away by the people. I was like, these are the best people in aviation. Like they just are. There's no bickering. There's no BS. There's, there's a little bit of wrestling after someone loses, but it's all in good fun, you know? And uh, I decided then I was like, I'm going to buy this company. If I can find a way for them to sell it to me, I'll buy this company because I think that there's a few missing pieces that my business background can bring to take it to the next level. And since we closed on the business, uh, my wife and I own it. It's been really remarkable. Actually, technically she owns it. I work for her. Thank you, taxes and IRS <laughs> and trying to figure out all these different business structures. Um, oh, <laughs> but uh, she so since December, we've seen our view count and our, our numbers start to explode based upon actually having a schedule for how we post post content. We're on track for one hundred and twenty million viewers this year. Wow. That's one hundred and twenty million, nine million on That's TikTok nuts. alone last week. Wow. Right? It's this wow. crazy numbers. And so mm. what we've realized is we have 45 to 55 year old white males in America, Brazil, Germany, and the UK on lock, right? And so now we need to find companies who want to market to them. So it's whether it's a testosterone clinic or it's, you know, it's Keeps or Viagra. We're trying to find these companies <laughs> that want to be in front of a Super Bowl size audience for a fraction of the price. That's the new challenge we have next. We're mm. developing the content. We have the story. The back end of that is that I, our, our filmmaker from Aviator, we actually stole from Disney during COVID. He's uh, amazing. Mm. And he uh, he's making a TV show of National Stole, much like Drive to Survive from Formula One. Uh, so cool. we, we've been in talks with a couple of different networks, but we really want Netflix. Call us. We, we want to have it side by side with Drive to Survive. Oh, that's cool. Um, and actually, just a week ago now, I saw this video of this Red Bull plane that landed in Dubai. Um, I don't know if you were involved with that one, but did, did I wasn't you see directly. That? My, my friend actually built that airplane. Um, really? So, yeah. So, he, so he got, do, got can you explain ready. to the listeners what happened? <clears throat> so the airplane took off and landed on the top of a helicopter pad in Dubai. And what's interesting about this is that helipad is 70 feet long. Last 70 week's 70 feet long, which sounds 70. crazy, right? It sounds yeah. crazy. Yeah. The way that we score national soul is just like golf. So there's a white line that you line up on and you take off. There's a measuring tape. How far did it take for him to get off the ground? And mm -hmm. then you come back around, you land just past that white line. As soon as your wheels touch down past the white line and stop, that's where we measure your landing. And we count them both together. So he had 140 feet combined to, to land and then take off, right? Mm -hmm. Our winner last week at National Stoll and Swamp Stoll in Louisiana, his combined takeoff and landing I don't want to hear this number. What? what? 35 feet. 35 feet. Okay. 35, 35 feet. Okay. So then 70, so 140. That's not it's so bad. plenty right? of room. Tons plenty of room. room. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I feel better. I thought you were going to be like 210 or something like no, that. No, no. He okay. got off the ground in eight feet and landed in 27. All right. Nuts. So we, wow. we have these crazy competitors. And, and we had a guy in our touring class who's flying a Cessna 205, big, huge six seat airplane off the ground in just under 100 feet. It's crazy. Mm. These guys are they're, they're learning their airplanes, becoming much mm. safer pilots. And it's super fun to watch. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. What a cool uh, what a cool. Yeah. The, the, the images that uh, I, 
I think I watched some videos on, I do watch videos on aviation on, on YouTube. So it clearly targeted me. That was the right target. Um, uh, now you, you've got a couple of kids now and um, you got involved in a community called Front Row Dads, which I just joined literally hey. like a couple of days ago. Uh, it's a group of dad entrepreneurs. Um, really interesting community, really engaged community from everything I've heard, uh, although I'm brand new. Talk a little bit about um, how you ended up getting involved in that community. Yeah, so I, I am on a deep mission. I already talked about therapy. We're just going to dive all the way in. I'm on a deep mission to be present with who I'm truly meant to be, whether that's through meditation, plant medicine, med uh, you know, traditional talk therapy, whatever it is. I, I want to be the man I was born to be. It's very important to me to face my own demons and to live beyond the fear. And so I had been on that journey with my wife for about four years. And we really have grown so much together. But there's always room to grow in different areas of our lives. And for me, parenting has been a really challenging one. Because while I certainly don't like the way that I was raised, I like the way I turned out. Right? <laughs> like, hey, I'm successful. And it's I did the all irony, things. right? There's lots right. of people who feel that way, especially if they were raised in poverty and you know, or, you know, suffering, they didn't have every opportunity handed to them. And, you know, then they've been successful in life and they want to get, you know, part of them wants to give their kids the things that they yearn for as a kid. And the other part, you know, you're saying to yourself, like, I can't do that because then they won't become the person that I'm most proud of that I've right. become. Yeah. And it's, and it's a delicate balance. So there's a group I've been in, in EO for about five years now, and there's a group of EO dads on WhatsApp. And I was reading through the hundreds of messages and, and my spare time. And somebody mentioned this group called Front Row Dads and they listed a podcast with it. And so I was like, oh, I'll go check it out. And I listened to the podcast and I was like, this, this guy is sharp. He gets it. He's, he's my kind of people. And at the time you couldn't sign up. You could sign up for a wait list. They only opened it a couple of times a year. And so I did. And when the wait list opened and I saw the price, I was like 200 bucks a month. Like, bro, that's so cheap compared to EO or YPO or any of these other groups that we're part of. It's like it's it's so freaking affordable. So I joined and I wasn't overwhelmed at first. The the virtual setting was not as valuable for me, but I, I signed up for the live. They had a, a live in-person event in Austin, Texas in December. And I have been to hundreds, if not thousands of events. And aside from one marriage class that my wife and I took that I credit with, like, re reigniting the, be the best marriage ever, like, 10 out of 10. I love my wife. Love what happened out of that. This was the best event I've ever been to. And it wasn't the speakers. It wasn't, you know, there's, there was no one thing. The craziest thing about it was because everyone aligns around six pillars, right? We have vibrant health. We have a thriving marriage. We have all these different pillars and business is one of them, but the core line from front row dads is that we, they, we are family men with businesses, not businessmen with families. Family is first. It's the most important priority in our lives. And yes, you want to be successful as hell. So you can spend more time with your family. That's a good thing. But that group of men, dude, I would sit down to lunch with eight guys and they'd give us a question to ask, like every conference does, you know, and you start to hear these answers. And I was so drawn to the way that these men reflected humility, passion, drive, and every, their, their answers could have been my answers, right? And there was not one person I met in a three-day event that I didn't want to get to know more. And that's literally never happened to me. I've never been to a marketing conference or a business conference where there wasn't that one guy in the hotel bar that you just couldn't stand, right? There was not a single guy that I couldn't stand. Every single one of them I wanted to dive deeper with. And so I went on a tangent and I, I went on a tear. Uh, I came home December 7th, I think it was. Since December 7th, I've averaged about 15 hours a week meeting with other front row dads mm. because it has become this obsession to better understand the things that they know more than I do. Because just like that question you asked of what do I provide my kids with? I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family that by the time we left for our trip every March had been broke for four months. You know, Christmas looked like toenail clippers. Uh, I got a vacuum cleaner one year. I literally got toenail clippers one year. I got toilet bowl cleaner one year. You know, like mm. these are my Christmas presents I'm unwrapping. Mm. Like this is, this is mm. highfalutin. So mm. I, that's obviously not my kid's experience. They can have anything they want in the world. And so how do I help, help keep them grounded? And we were talking briefly before the call or before this podcast, but this idea of travel to me is such an imperative thing and travel to places where people have a much more challenging life to go in service of them. I just got back from uh, eight days in Cuba and I spent some time there in 2017. And the difference in that country between 2017 and today is so humbling and so empowering at the same time. It's like I live in a place where it's so easy to 
be a loving father. They, they had us bring soap. They couldn't get soap. Even the black market. The black market sold out of soap in Cuba right now. Wow. Right? Wow. Like it's a crazy experience to be around these people who love life despite not having the things that we have. And so mm. I want that for my kids too. So Front Row Dads has been a huge part of that. Uh, I, I've, I never thought I'd ever leave EO. EO is my family for the last five years. And I, I told my forum last month, like, guys, I'm, I'm out. I'm putting all my time into Front Row Dads. These guys are my people. And mm. we want to move. We, we want to go move to wherever the, the most Front Row Dads are. It's silly. I've never <laughs> felt such a sense of community in my life. And I've been in a lot of communities. Wow. That's cool. Um, I get, I can tell when you find your new thing, you are all in, <laughs> you tend to be all into whatever you do. No half-assing it for you. No, like toe in the water. I'm dumping it, jumping in the deep end. Um, well, Eric, this has been really cool. I love hearing the, all your stories and everything. I'll encourage everyone to definitely go check out your book, Farewell to Normal. And I understand you have a new website. Where can people go to, um, learn more about you and your various different businesses? Yeah, just ericfarewell.com. It's like you say goodbye. So E-R-A-C-F-A-R-E-W-E-L-L.com. Excellent. All right, Eric. Thanks so much. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.